Right, we should be live on all platforms again. Uh, I will hand over to Pedro, who is going to be our host uh, for the next session. And uh, we'll hand on into the night to a series of hosts, mostly based in North America. Um, so in that sense, I'm going to hop off the call. Uh, you're going to message me if it all falls to pieces, but it should be fine. And uh, I can't wait to hear about magnetotactic microorganisms. Thanks, Joe. Uh, so as Joe was saying, we're about to start the session about the magnetotactic organisms. Uh, it's my pleasure to be a host today. My name is Pedro. And well, enough talking. I will pass the room to Igor. He will introduce himself and talk a little bit about the work he's been, he's have been developing for a while in the lab. It's up to you, Igor. Go for it. Hello, guys. My name is Igor. First, I would like to thank you for the invitation to be here today and to talk about a little of our research here in Brazil. So I have to share my screen. So uh, today we're going to talk a little about uh, magnetotactic microorganisms. And especially today, we're going to talk about magnetotactic bacteria diversity and their spatial distribution in the Araguaia River food plain, which is a site in the Brazilian Cerrado and Amazon, which is a very cool, cool place to study. So my name is Igor, as I said before, and my supervisor, PI, is Professor Fernanda Breu, and we work at the Universidade of Federal Rio de Janeiro. So uh, the first thing that I'd like to say to you guys and ask is what is magnetotactic, uh, magnetotaxis? And I like to show this with a video. Uh, so here we're gonna, we're gonna see how this behavior works. And this is a, an edge drop. Here we have a lot of magnetic bacteria. This is set in a dick microscopy. Here is the edge drop. And then we switch the magnet that is placed on the stage of the microscope. And then the magnetic bacteria swim uh, in direction of the magnet or either it swims uh, running from it. Uh, these bacteria, they tend to swim in uh, uh, anti-parallel to the magnet. And every time we switch the magnet, we can see that they, they drive or they concentrate. But this phenom is, it occurs in bacteria, but not only in them. They also occur in magnetotactic eukaryotes, which was Pedro's uh, previous work on his thesis. And this is the same thing on the edge drop. Here are the eukaryotes. And the same thing as we switch the magnet, the eukaryotes swim away from the edge drop and then they concentrate again. So this have this response to the magnetic field that in this case is induced by placing a magnet on the stage of the microscope. And how this happens, these magnetotactic microorganisms have two unique features that they can passively align or orientate themselves to the, to the earth geomagnetic field and through their active flagellar propulsion, they swim and respond to the specific orientation. So the, the main characteristics about this group of bacteria is that they are gram negative. They can be unicellular uh, microorganisms. Here we can see the flagella, or they can be multicellular as they call MMPs, multicellular magnetotactic prokaryotes. And they are capable of synthesizing, or the more precise term, biomineralize a ferromagnetic nanocrystal, which is this guy here called the magnetosome. And it's surrounded by a biological membrane, as we can see here on the stem image. And this process is controlled by a set of genes called the magnetosome gene clusters and GCs. And this trait uh, uh, by the, caused by the, the biomineralization of the magnetosomes and the active flagellar propulsion uh, corresponds to the magnetotactic behavior. And we can classify these organisms based on uh, a lot of things. We can, we can catalog these magnetosomes. They can be cataloged into their chemical composition, whether it's magnetite or gradeite. Uh, uh, they can be characterized regarding their chain organization or the crystal morphology. As we can see here, they have uh, very unique shapes and these shapes are species specific. Uh, we see that a cuboectroidal shape, uh, octaedros, prismatic, and anisotropic, which they resemble a bullet. <laughs> 
And this magnetosome, this magnetosome in particular can be used in a lot of biotechnological applications such as cell separation, hypertemia, drug delivery, food analysis, uh, DNA, DNA and antigen analysis can be used to image contrast in MRIs and etc. immobilization of enzymes. So this, this is very versatile and can be used to a lot of things. And the advantage is that it can be magnetically recovered or magnetically recovered. And talking about our work here, the, uh, about the geographic localization. So this is the map of Brazil. And our area of study is here on the Aragaya River in, right in the middle of our country. And we are located here in Rio de Janeiro at UFRJ. And why did we go there to study what we study? Uh, the Araguaia River, so it's a cell oligotrophic, uh, meaning that it has low nutrients and has an acidic pH. And the Bananal Island, which is located somewhere here, is the world's largest pluvial island. And these are some photographs of the place that we went, some aerial images. So that's a very beautiful place if you want to go visit or spend your vacation to. And why study MTB in this place? So this is a giant field of work who can generate large amounts of data from a field that we don't know or we don't know these conditions. We can understand uh, MTB spatial distribution and how the, the magnetosomes that they demineralize are also distributed in this place. Uh, species that are going to be prospected can have some biotechnological applications and they, are, they belong to, the, to our national territory. And we can enrich our biodiversity from the Cerrado and the Brazilian Amazon. And the team that is indirectly involved in this particular research is our PI, Professor Fernanda Jefferson. Our, uh, he's, he's already a PhD and he works with microscopy now, Juliana, that is master in science, and Professor Alex Prast, that is our collaborator in the Linköping University at Sweden. And just to, to talk a little fast about, uh, we, so we sample this, this bacteria, this sediment with water, and we basically divided this area. We cover uh, approximately a thousand kilometers kilometers of river extension and from Pará, it's a very, it, it could be, I don't know, it's a very, very large distance. And we did, we did this to understand how the abiotic factors are dispersed and what they influence, but that's not the main point that I want to show you guys here. What I want to show you guys is that what we found in this place. So we divided in the bacteria from the main channel and the bacteria that we found in its lakes and tributaries. And for our surprise, what we found. Uh, let me stop the laser. I need to click on the video. So the bacteria from, from the main channel, they're majorly cocoid, which means they are spherical. And the same thing here, we, we place the magnet and this is the edge drop. Then when the North, the, the North Pole is uh, directed to the edge drop, then they swim toward, towards it. And when the edge the reverse the magnet, then the bacteria swim away from it. And these ones are majorly found in the river main channel. And for our surprise, there is a completely different population of MTB that are in the lakes and tributaries. And what we see is that they have other shapes and morphologies. Some of them are ovoid, some of them are rods, and some of them are vibrioid and spirilla. And the same thing that we, I've talked to you guys, when we reverse the magnet, they're going to perform a turn, we, what we call a, a U-turn. And then it's all fun when you guys uh, see this. <laughs> uh, once we revert again, they will swim away from it. And then we reverse again, they go back to the edge drop, concentrating again. So, uh, as I said before, oh, I'm sorry. 
So I said before, uh, we sampled in 14 points and the first four were in the river main channel and the, the morphology was cocoid bacteria with some vibrios and the other sites on lakes and tributaries were majorly rod shaped bacteria, ovoids, spirilla and vibrioidid cells when you see this in the set of images. And when we understand this occurrence and spatial distribution, we understand that the, the, the magnetotactic pocket, which are this one, they are distributed made, when we do this diagram chord plot, we understand that they are majorly uh, located in the river main channel. And the other morphologies are located in, uh, here in green, in the lakes and tributaries, uh, the, the rods, the spirilla and the vibrioid. And we can see when we perform a sort of uh, set of statistics analysis that some uh, abiotic factors are important for driving this diversity. And there are some clusters uh, when they are very proximal to each other about their morphology composition. And just to illustrate what these magnetotactic cocci, cocci are, uh, we have a, uh, they are very diverse. They have a high diversity. They are prevailing in the main channel. They majorly synthesize uh, octahedral magnetosomes, which are in this area, as you can see. And here in this inset is the greater magnification. As in some of them, you can see the flagella, when it is this arrow, this purple arrowhead. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, we have a great diversity also of magnetotactic vibrios. The same thing here. So in some of them, you can see the flagella on the stem images, a uh, large diversity of magnetosomes. And on lakes and tributaries, we also have a large, uh, large diversity of this, these microorganisms. Uh, these are the magnetosome chain within the cell, uh, the large modification. Some of them can be analyzed uh, hundreds of magnetosomes. These are rod-shaped bacteria. These are the spirilla. In some of them, you can see the flagella, and these are the ovoid bacteria. And these magnetosomes, they don't have any particular kind of organization. These just are concentrated in this pole of the cell. And we can form, perform a lot of statistical analysis and catalog these magnetosomes regarding their morphology. But the fun thing is here is that we can see and predict uh, their size doing linear regression, and some of them fit quite well. Uh, but the anisotropic magnetosomes, which are these three sets, they don't quite fit here. They are more like a sigmoidal distribution, which is fun to understand. And the same thing uh, happens when we use the abiotic factors to understand how these magnetosomes are uh, spatially distributed in this, in this space. And they also form uh, some kind of narrow clusters depending on their composition. And when we see, uh, when we talk about uh, the magnetosome, what one of these particular traits is that it is a magnetic monodomain. And what that means, it means that uh, these, these, this mineral, this ferromagnetic mineral is permanently magnetized. So, so what happens is when we plot uh, the length of the magnetosomes per shape factor, which means they are more elongated, more elongated or the, the, their dimensions of width and length are equal, we see that they are distributed in a dot plot and they are clearly positioned in a mono domain uh, from biogenic magnetite. And funny things, uh, fun things when we see that is that are some giant crystals that, that are hard to find in normal samples. And is, they are present in the sample of the Araguaia River, which are giant octahedral magnetosomes that are ranging from almost 200 nanometers. And here is their, their distribution, the recording the dot plot, which fits a log normal distribution. And the things that we found so far in this, this particular site of study is that we, don't, we didn't find any magnetotactic multicellular prokaryotes, which are highly related to high salinity plates. We didn't find any eukaryotes or magnetotactic consortia, uh, but we could understand their spatial distribution uh, in the sites of the, the river main channel and its lakes and tributaries. 
we saw that the magnetotactic cochlea are the most abundant morphotype presenting in this, this particular environment. And as we're talking about the freshwater river, we can exclude the salinity factor, which many authors uh, extensively describe how this affected the MTB diversity. And then we can understand how some other factors like the, uh, the potential reduction can influence the pH, the dissolved oxygen, and even the water transparency can influence and shape uh, the MTB population, the populational dynamics. And the Bananal Islands, which I talked to you guys uh, earlier, that is the world's largest fluvial uh, island. It's a natural MTB hotspot, which was a uh, new, new discovery. And future perspectives talking about this work is that we're gonna understand uh, as we have this large area of study, how the microbiome of MTB is structured using a gene mark as the 16 as RNA gene uh, and search for the biomineralization genes that are involved in this process. And we are already conducting a species prospection to study bio future biotechnological applications from bacteria that are uh, from here, from Brazil, and to further to confirm the chemical composition of the magnetosomes by microanalysis. And here are some photos of the, the field trip. And here are some of the people that went with us. Uh, this was a multidisciplinary uh, uh, travel with uh, lo lots of areas of study, including fishing uh, and sediment uh, core sampling. Uh, here we are in the river. Here are the people and the guy that drove us from in the boat. Here we are drinking some beer in a small town in the middle of the state of Mato Grosso. And I would like to say special thanks to our lab founder, Professor Ulysses Lins, which is no longer with us. He unfortunately passed away uh, three, four years ago. And our friends here, here is Pedro on his PhD thesis after he defended his PhD thesis. Our friends here from the, from the lab, here are our social, our social media. And I would like, also would like to thank uh, our financial support and the infrastructure used in this project. And that's it, guys. I hope you all enjoyed. Thank you, Vigor. It's always amazing for me to see what you guys uh, are up to in the lab. And yeah, we're a little short on time, but again, I would like to thank you. I uh, really appreciate what you have been doing and can, can't wait to see what's come up next in, from this project and from all the other projects you're involved in. I'm pleased to be here today and I would really like to thank the invitation to be here and talk a little, a little bit about our work. <laughs> Let me allow our next speaker to be here with us. Lucia uh, will talk a little bit more about the potential applications of magnetosomes and magnetotactic bacteria soon. Uh, if you want to start introducing yourself, Lucia, be my guest. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation to be part of this session today. Um, yeah, so thank you for inviting me here. It's a pleasure for me to talk about magnetotactic bacteria also. Uh, so I'm a PhD student in the University of the Basque Country, and uh, I mainly work with the biomedical applications of magnetotactic bacteria. Uh, I will try to share my screen for you to see. Okay. Um, and I will start my presentation. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, it's working. Okay. So Igor already introduced you magnetotactic bacteria, but I will talk to you about our work, which is in the biomedical applications of them. Um, so uh, bacteria in general have a long history in cancer therapy because already in the 1890, Coley discovered that some, um, some can cancer patients recover after suffering bacterial infections that destroys the tumor. So over, over the last century, many genera of bacteria are being investigated to treat cancer because they have so many advantages that make them ideal for this purpose. For example, they have the ability to infect and kill uh, specifically cancer cells because 
Um, for example, they can compete with them for the nutrients and they some some of them secrete and secrete some exotoxins that um, um, activates the immune system so that um, yeah the body fights again against the tumors. Moreover, they are motile. So most of them they have their flagella so that they can swim and go deep into the tumoral tissues. Um, and also, which is really interesting, is that mostly we use um, all, the, all the anaerobic uh, strains or microaerophilic strains of bacteria are being investigated for this because normally the tumors have like a really strange vasculature so that there is like a low concentration of oxygen so that this bacteria will be um, attracted to this, specifically to these uh, tumoral areas, which is great. But mostly the bacteria um, have a like major drawback, which is that we couldn't detect them inside the body and it's impossible to guide them to the desired area. But um, we have the magnetotactic bacteria that uh, have the magnetic chain, which makes them like special, um, mostly because we could detect them by using, for example, magnetic resonance imaging once they are in the body. And we could also, and more importantly, guide them to the tumoral area um, really easily because we could guide them with by using external magnetic fields. So uh, in our group, we propose the, the use of magnetotactic bacteria for cancer treatment, and I will explain you today how. Um, magnetosomes by themselves have also been proposed for biomedical applications because they have many advantages also compared with uh, chemi chemically synthesized magnetic nanoparticles. For example, the level of purity and crystallinity of magnetosomes is really high and the, they are really uniform in terms of uh, size and morphology. They have interesting magnetic properties and um, Compare, I think the major advantage compared with magnetic, uh, chemically synthesized magnetic nanoparticles is that they have the biological coating, which is composed of lipids and proteins, which makes them like more compatible with cells and uh, makes them easy to functionalize with, for example, some anti-cancer molecules or something like that. And uh, compared to chemically produced nanoparticles, they are environmentally friendly, which is great also. But they have also some drawbacks. Uh, for example, the production of magnetosomes is quite low and they are not, they are not able to self-propel. So which uh, guides me again to magnetotactic bacteria. So we think in our group, and I hope that you think, uh, think it too about after my talk, that magnetotactic bacteria are ideal uh, candidates for cancer therapy nanorobots because they have uh, flagella so that they can swim inside the body at towards the tumor. Um, they have also chemical and oxygen receptor, receptors so that they could swim towards the hypoxic, re, hypoxic regions of the, of the tumor. Um, they also have the magnetic chain, most importantly, which makes them magnetotactic, <laughs> yeah, uh, so that we could guide them, as I explained to you before, by using magnetic fields. And they could also be functionalized with, for example, uh, drug drugs for anti-cancer treatment so that they would only um, they will transport the drugs to the tumoral area only and yeah, do like more specific treatment. So there are several uh, biomedical applications that have been proposed for this bacteria, but here I put the main three, I think, which, uh, which are drug delivery, uh, magnetic hyperthermia and MRI imaging. In our group, uh, we mainly work with magnetic hyperthermia and it's what I'm going to explain now. Uh, but after my talk, uh, after I finish up with magnetic hyperthermia, I will show you some cool videos and images about drug delivery too. Um, so magnetic hyperthermia, for those of you that are not familiar with this technique, is a therapy for cancer treatment that is based on the injection of magnetic nanoparticles or magnetic bacteria in this case in the tumoral area and the application of an alternating magnetic field. So when the field is applied, the magnetic nanoparticles they release heat so that they increase um, the temperature, specifically in the tumor, up to 42 degrees Celsius or so, which is enough to debilitate or kill cancer cells, and it doesn't affect healthy tissues. So uh, it's great because it's more specific than uh, chemotherapy, and for example. So it's been used um, for uh, glioblastoma, I think, since 2011 but with uh, chemically synthesized nanoparticles. But in this case, we propose magnetotactic bacteria for that. 
Okay, so we did a study where we, I'm not going to go into detail with this because I know most of you are microbiologists, me too, but uh, we measured the heat inefficiency of bacteria compared with magnetosomes. And surprisingly, we saw that they are more efficient in heating, so increasing the temperature of the tumors, the bacteria than the magnetosomes, which is great because this is another advantage of them. So we did an in vitro experiment with using magnetotactic bacteria and long carcinoma cells. So we incubate, incubated them together. And for this, we used um, MSR1, which is Magnetosphere Long Griffiths Valdense. Um, we incubated them with the cells uh, for 24 hours, and then we checked the cytotoxicity of the bacteria in, in the cells. Then we applied the magnetic field uh, in uh, clinical conditions, and we also checked the viability of the cells to see if the treatment was or not effective. Okay, first of all, some nice pictures because we wanted to see if bacteria and these cells interact with each other, because if not, that would be nonsense. So here we see the scanning electron micrographs where we see the magnetosperilum in orange and the cells in gray, so that they interact kind of in the surface. But with um, fluorescence microscope in the left, we also saw that um, they get into the cells because we can see the bacteria in red with rhodamine and in blue, the nuclei of the cells. Um, but then we confirmed this by using transmission electron microscopy where we can see the bacteria inside the cells. And here, for example, uh, we can see in the right image, the nuclei of the cells and the bacteria inside. So this is great. This is the first step. And then we wanted to check the cytotoxicity of the bacteria in the cells. For this, as I told you, we incubated them together for 24 hours. And we checked if uh, cells died after this incubation period by using flow cytometry and uh, propidium judai that only stains the dead cells. And we saw that both control cells and bacteria loaded cells had like a similar percentage of death. So we concluded that um, uh, in principle, magneto magnetospirillum are not toxic for the cell, which is great because it leads us to the next step, which is applying the magnetic field and uh, checking again the, the death efficiency, or let's say the hyperthermia treatment efficiency by using Propidium you died again. And we saw that two hours after the magnetic field application and 24 hours after the, the hyperthermia treatment, the um, percentage of dead cells increased like significantly, which is great because that means that the hyperthermia with magnetotactic bacteria actually works, at least in vitro. Then we will have to try it in vivo, but that's a step further. Okay, so we also saw like there is an effect of uh, with hyperthermia for the growth rate of the cells. So when they were incubated with bacteria and the control cells had a similar growth rate, but when we apply the magnetic field with the bacteria, this was really slower, especially after 48 hours after the treatment. So again, this is a good news, but then we will have to, to follow our experiments to see if if we can uh, someday like have this treatment really in clinical trials. Okay, so I told you that I will show you some cool videos and I promised it. So here, as I told you, is bacteria could also be used for drug delivery because they can swim. In here, you can see magnetospirillum also in my micro channel where we put a magnetic field horizontally. So you can see how they swim uh, in the direction of the magnetic field which is cool because that means that we could guide them inside the body. And this is an experiment done by another group of Felful uh, and their colleagues, where we see another species of magnetotactic bacteria, which is uh, Magnetococcus marinus. Uh, what they did here was to attach some liposomes that had anti-cancer drugs inside to the surface of the bacteria. So it's more like a, another step for drug delivery. So once the liposomes were, are attached in the bacteria, we could um, guide them to the tumoral area. And uh, if everything goes well, they will only release the, their content in, once in the tumor. So this is like a beginning of, a, of, I think, a big thing. So hopefully in some years we will see all together in a cancer therapy treatment, I don't know. So uh, I would like to thank all my colleagues for, and our collaborators for all the work 
Um, and yeah, I want to thank you again, Pedro, for letting me speak today. And I hope that I have convinced you about uh, the applications of magnetotactic bacteria. And if you have any questions, please ask me. Thank you. That was an amazing talk, Lucia. Lucia, <laughs> a lot of nice stuff that you have been doing for some time. Uh, yeah, we have some time for some questions. I can't see any uh, here now, but I have a lot of questions, so I will take okay. some. <laughs> so, what are what? So you're saying that there's a lot of uh, promising things that you guys have found out so far. Um, what? It's the next step. I mean, what do you think? It's giving is putting us a little back to go to clinical trials or even to some more. Uh, I don't know, other types of experiments that could lead us to a direction where we can actually use this for therapy? So there are many things that we can do. For example, I think that there are some groups that are already trying this with uh, mice uh, in terms of magnetic hyperthermia, but I think that also we will have to see uh, if the magnetosprelum, for example, could be like um, functionalized with, I don't know, anti-cancer drugs and so on. And I think there's a lot of work to do still on the navigations of this bacteria inside the body. Like I showed you a video in a micro channel with water, which is easy, but then inside the body and the, the blood is quite different. So I don't know. I think it will be the next step. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It will be interesting to see them, their behavior in more complex environments, right? How they will behave yeah, yeah, yeah. and all this. Yeah, yeah I think a lot of groups are studying that. We are, we are doing it at the moment, but yeah, there's a lot of uh, investigation there. Nice. Can't wait to see what's up next for you guys. I thank you so much for, for, for a talk. That was amazing to have you here uh, in the session. Thank you. I will put the next speaker up. Our last speak, speaker of the session will be Dennis. That will be talking a little bit more about how it's the scenario of the evolution and the diversity of the magnetotactic organisms so far. Hi. Hi Hello, Dennis. Well, I will let you, I will let you the room, let you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about the evolution okay. of magnetotactic bacteria. Yes. My name is Dennis Grusdev. I'm co-founder of genomic analysis startup Siber. And today I will talk about diversity and evolution of magnetic bacteria. And uh, I will start from the history of, um, uh, in the middle 60s, Salvatore Bellini discovered unusual movement um, of bacteria. He observed uh, large number of bacteria swimming in a single direction and they have magnetic behavior. And he suggested that this behavior is due to the presence of a magnetic compass inside the bacteria. And uh, 10 years later, Richard Blakemore uh, independently rediscovered magnetotactic bacteria or MTB. Um, and was the first who demonstrated Bellini's magnetic, uh, magnetic compass within cells. He observed tiny magnets organized in chains, um, and these particles, as you know, called magnetosomes. MTB is a common uh, name for a large, a large bacterial group that have ability to form magnetosomes and have mag magnetotactic behavior. Uh, MTB are diverse in their cell morphology, different spirilla, vibrios, cocci, uh, multicellular uh, bacteria were shown. Shapes and composition of magnetosomes, uh, magnetosome crystals are also different. Magnetosome crystal can consist of magnetite or graygite, and usually magnetosomes are aligned in single chain. However, MTB with multiple chains uh, and clustered magnetosomes uh, were observed. Magnetosome formation is uh, controlled um, by specific magnetosome genes. In the genomes of all MTB, magnetosome genes are present as operons or clusters. Um, and uh, all, all MTB have a common nine essential genes located in mama B uh, operon, and they're necessary for 
Safari. Yeah, if you have some slides, we, we cannot see it at the moment. <laughs> oh my God, sorry. Oh, I then, just oh. started. <laughs> um, I guess you're over okay. if you had time. Briefly, I can repeat that uh, magnetactic bacteria is bacteria that can produce uh, magnetosomes. Uh, they have a, um, usually they have a different uh, cell shape, including spirilla, rods, uh, vibros, and etc. And usually, magnetosomes uh, magnetosomes also different in their composition, including um, they uh, they can consist from magnetite or bragite and have the different shapes. And the uh, magnetism by mineralization process is controlled genetically uh, and nine essential genes present in um, all genomes, uh, in all genomes of MTB. And uh, uh, in all genomes of MTB, sorry. Uh, uh, and as was said by Lucia, magnesium have a huge biotechnological uh, potential and could be used in several biomedical applications. But the main problem um, for the wider use of magnesium is their limited production. The fact is that cultured MTB produce only, uh, only 15, 20 milligrams of magnetism per liter of culture. And what, what are the ways out? Uh, the first is the optimization of MTB growth condition, but over 30 years of uh, attempts to optimize, the breakthrough did not happen. Uh, the second is genetic engineering and, and the transfer of magnesium genes into an easily cultivated bacteria. Uh, and the third is the search and the isolation pure culture of MTB producing a greater number of magnetosomes. For example, Magnetobacterium barbaricum produce uh, uh, up to 1,000 magnetosomes per cell. As for genetic engineering, uh, there is some progress. So in 2014, German group transferred the genes for magnetosome synthesis into Rhodospirium rubrum, and uh, it began to make magnetosomes. But unfortunately, this magnesium had too much, uh, too much uh, distribution in size uh, and was synthesized only in the light. This, uh, this indicates that we still poorly understand the process of magnesium synthesis. And uh, to understand it, we, uh, we need more information about the genomes, uh, diversity, and evolution of MTB. Um, Sorry, and well, now um, directly about the study of diversity MTB, I conventionally divided the last 50 years into three parts. The first of uh, them um, ends at the beginning of the 10th of the 21st century. During this period, the study of MTB diversity is limited to, uh, to the isolation and description of pure cultures of MTB and the analysis of clone libraries or the 16S RNA gene. Uh, so uh, already 25 years ago, we knew that MTB are found among alpha and delta protobacteria and uh, the not yet named phylum nitrospirota. Uh, all known MTB of the uh, alpha protobacteria class belong to two orders, uh, Rhodospirillalis and Magnetococcalis. This is the most studied group of MTB and uh, bacteria of the genus Magnetospirillum are model organisms for studying magnetoreception and synthesis of magnetosomes. And uh, MTB from the um, order, order Rhodospirillalis are spirilla or vibrions, or vibrions that synthesize one chain of cubatedral or prismatic uh, magnetite magnetosomes. MTB from order Magnetococcalis often include cocoid bacteria that produce magnetite magnetosomes, which can organize uh, in one or more chains or not at all. Uh, this order is very interesting in the light of the study of evolution. Uh, first, uh, this order will soon be reclassified as a new class within protobacteria and uh, 
um, absolutely all bacteria in this group can produce magnetosomes, which is uh, which is exceptional. And to be from delta protobacteria uh, or disulfobacterota are the most diverse in cell shape or magnetosome types. Uh, there are bacteria that can, can produce both type magnetosomes, uh, magnetosome crystals, uh, magnetite and gregite, and even both types of magnetosome uh, in one cell, like Disulfantulus magnetovolumortis. This group uh, also includes amazing multicellular uh, prokaryotes. Mm. Uh, and the second period is mediated by the beginning um, of work on metagenomic and single cell studies. During this period, our understanding of the um, MTB of the phylum nitrospirota and protobacteria were significantly expanded. Bacteria uh, were um, also bacteria were MTB were identif uh, identified in the phylum in the phylum uh, uh, Omnitrophota, previously known as OP3, and in the class gamma protobacteria. Uh, known and to be from gamma protobacteria are mesophilic, microarophilic rods, and uh, they binaryze either cubactahedral or elongated prismatic crystals of uh, magnetite uh, in their magnetosomes, like the alpha protobacterial MTB. Uh, a large morphological diversity of MTB and phylum nitrospirota was shown. And unfortunately, not a single MTB of this phylum is related in axenic culture, but we know um, of huge ro uh, rods, small vibras, and cocci that can synthesize from 10 to 1,000 ball-shaped magnetosomes. Uh, it's also worth mentioned the discovery of MTB uh, in the film on Nitrophota, uh, but it's all complicated. <laughs> and during this period, enough information was also accumulated to formulate the evolutionary scheme, which was support, supported by most scientists. It was concluded that um, genes for the synthesis uh, for the magnetosome since a period once in the common ancestor of protobacteria on nitrophota and nitrospirota. And these genes uh, disappear, disappeared in some classes of protobacteria. Also during this period, the accumulation of metagenomic data in uh, open databases takes place. This led to, to the identification of magnetosome genes in context of bacterial genomes from the phyloplankton mycetota and latestibacterota. Uh, and phylogenetic analysis showed that uh, these bacteria most likely syn synthesize gregite type magnetosomes. Uh, but unfortunately, we still have no idea <laughs> what these bacteria look like or what shape of their magnetosomes. Uh, well, and the third period came quite recently and is associated with the introduction of metagenomic approach uh, and uh, culture-dependent analysis into microbiological practice. Um, so in 2018, the article was published describing 28 reconstructed uh, uh, from metagenomes, MTB genomes which exceeded, exceeded the total number of MTB genomes sequenced all previous years. Also, MTB were first discovered in Zeta and uh, Lambda protobacteria classes of protobacteria. But unfortunately, we also still do not know anything about their morphology, but it was predicted, uh, predicted, predicted that uh, they should produce magnetite magnetosomes. Um, and at the same time, the new hypotheses for the evolution of magnet magnetotaxis were formulated. And uh, it is a very complex process, um, as we, we think the evolution included vertical inheritance from one common ancestor with multiple duplications, losses, and horizontal gene transfers. Uh, and two years later, the article was published on the reconstruction of MTB genomes from open databases and several dozens, dozen MTB genomes were reconstructed, including those belong to bacteria from phyla 
uh, nitrospinota, gidrogenidentota, and the Lucy microbiota. And uh, performed uh, phylogenetic analysis re revealed multiple um, discrepancies when, uh, when comparing the topologies of phylogenomic and the mag magnetosome trees, which indicate a great influence of uh, horizontal gene transfer uh, on the MTB evolution process. And a few months later, the analysis of 168 metagenome assembled MTB genomes were presented and uh, four pr previously unknown MTB containing phyla were identified, including rifle bacteriota, fibra bacteriota, Della vibrianota, and Uba 10199. And again, in the end, we have only genomes. Um, also, in this article was an interesting but controversial theory uh, that the last bacterial common ancestor could synthesize magnetosomes. And it is very interesting theory, but we need more data and uh, uh, hear a lot of work. And uh, well, I want to sum up with a picture with the current situation. Uh, it should be said that right now is, is the golden age of studying the MTB diversity because most MTB containing phyla uh, were discovered in the last three years. But as you can see, we have a huge bias to, uh, toward genomics. That is all we, uh, we have is genomes. It should be said that the diversity MTB is much greater than is known today. And uh, so the amount of genomic data will increase for objective reason. But I really hope uh, that uh, you and I will be able not only to get hung up on genomes, but also to describe the morphology of cells the mar and magnetosomes from new phylogenetic groups, which ultimately will help to fully understand uh, the process of evolution and process of magnetosome synthesis. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dennis, for the great talk. I mean, I'm a little biased here, but I, I think this is fascinating and still so much stuff for us to find out. Uh, not only what are the other shapes of this magnetotetic organisms, but also the big question where they came from and what they are doing here exactly, how hard they're important for the biochemical cycles, all this stuff. Uh, my question to you that I guess it's a tricky question. Um, so we saw the, the, the last work from your group that Maria was, is developing and that we have a lot of uh, really ancient branches with magnetotetic bacteria. So wh where do you think this, this will go? I mean, are we getting closer to find that they are even more ancient than the Delta Protobacteria class that we find out before? Uh. Thank you for your question. It is really important um, to understand that if we see magnetotactic bacteria in a um, um, phylogenetic group that near to the root of uh, bacterial tree, universal bacterial tree, this, um, um, this, this is not meaning that this uh, phenotype and genotype uh, um, was received uh, vert through vertical evolution, through, through vertical inheritance, uh, because now we know that um, um, some genes can be transferred through the phyla, uh, interphyla um, um, horizontal gene transfer. It is very interesting because uh, we do not really know how they look like. Uh, we are, I, I am not sure that they produce uh, magnetosomes. Maybe it can be some different process. And uh, I think that not all magnetotactic uh, bacteria, bacteria that can produce uh, magnetosome, use them for the magnetotaxis, for example. Maybe. Mm, mm, they can have another function for uh, these organelles. 
Yeah, I think this is really interesting what you were saying because I completely agree with you. I don't think the magnetosomes arrive as they are right now today. So maybe a more ancient structure was developed before with some of the genes that are doing something else. And yes. today we have the modern magnetosomes. But yeah, this is really interesting. I have no clue what we are going to find out next, but I'm looking we forward have, to it. We have a, a few surprises for you in the okay. next year. Yes. <laughs> looking forward to, to see what you guys do bring. Uh, thanks again, Dennis. I will wrap up this session a little bit. Um, do we have some of the hosts around here? Hello. Hello, Ben. Hi. So yeah, are you, you finished no more questions. We're ready to wrap up the uh, Magnesium uh, session now. Yeah, well, I think we're, we're good. Please. Great. Well, uh, thank you, Pedro, and thank you, Dennis. Thank you to all the speakers of this uh, session. It was very, very interesting indeed. Um, yeah, I always get fascinated by these uh, magnetotactic uh, tactic bacteria. They're so cool. I've never worked on them myself, but uh, yeah, it's nice that we get an opportunity to discuss them in this forum. And so thank you for, for chairing it, Pedro. Um, just looking at the time, yeah, we're getting close to the next session now, which is uh, bidding singletons. So while we prepare for that, I'll say, yeah, thank you, Pedro. It's been a pleasure. And I'll just remind everyone of what's going on this evening. Well, it's evening here in Stockholm where I am, but for wherever, uh, everywhere else, we're kind of going across the time zones now. And it's getting exciting because although it's still the 16th of September here in Stockholm, it's not quite... International Microorganism Day for us, International Microorganism Day is the 17th. More and more uh, countries are getting into that uh, kind of crossing the boundary and being able to celebrate for real. So I know uh, Australia and um, a lot of Asia now coming into International Microorganism Day. So that's exciting. We'll get there. We'll get there soon.